Hello, and welcome to Cine Nebraskans, the daily Nebraskan entertainment podcast. Uh, as always, I'm your host, Kyle Cruz, and I'm joined by my co-host. Hey, everybody. Uh, my name is David Berman. Um, I am uh, an assistant culture editor for the Daily Nebraskan, so uh, I edit all those good stories that you guys read. And yeah, uh, as I mentioned, I'm Kyle Cruz, and I write mainly just movie reviews for the DN, a couple other random things here and there, and host this podcast. Um, and yeah, with that said, let's just jump into it with our first main, uh, our first, uh, what's, what's the word I'm looking for? This is already, yeah. Thank you. Um, <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll jump into our first segment, I think is the, what I'm trying to say. And that's what have I done? And what have I done is the segment in which we just talk about what we've been up to lately, what form of entertainment we've been consuming, whether that be movies or whatever. This is generally a movie podcast, but today neither of us are going to talk about movies. Um, so David, I'll actually let you start. Um, so what have you been up to the past few weeks? Yeah, so um, over the like, past two weeks or so, um, I played through uh, The Last of Us, um, which is a game from about like seven years ago um, on, on the PS4. Uh, and it's like this post-apocalyptic, um, you know, c- c- post zombie like pandemic kind of game um where you know it, it's it's focused on these two people um Joel who's this guy who's been you know kind of beaten down by the world that he's in and it, you know i guess spoiler alert in the first 15 minutes of the game his daughter is killed at like the outbreak of this pandemic and then it kind of cuts 20 years later and he's kind of you know trying to survive in this world where you know, there aren't that many people left, but the people who are left are not, not great. And they, you know, people do whatever it takes to survive. Um, and so he is tasked with um, protecting this girl who is immune to the, to the virus and can, uh, and offers hope for some sort of cure. And it's kind of about like their trip across the United States and um, how he kind of, you know, comes to terms with his daughter's death and forms this like paternal bond with this girl Ellie um and yeah so you know it's it's a very well-known game um you know it's it's great it's really really good um it, it kind of raises the bar for what kind of stories can be told in video games you know I think a lot of video games you know sacrifice story for the sake of gameplay and this really just you know does not compromise in that at all it really is like a Hollywood level story and you know and, and it, it it's uh, I think we talked about it on the show. It's um, HBO's adapting it into a TV series, and I'm really excited for that because I think that it's just ripe for some sort of you know series, and I think it could really work. Um, so yeah, I've been playing it, uh, and uh, yeah, I've really loved it. And today, actually, as as we record, uh, the sequel comes out tonight at 11 p.m. So that's what I will be doing tonight. So. <laughs> nice. Um, so what's what's the actual like gameplay of the game like? Like, so I, I've heard a lot about the story over the past few years, just because it's a very popular game. Yeah. Um, but um, how how does the gameplay like tie into that? Like, what's yeah? Yeah. So it's you know like it's a very fun game to play, and it, it, it sounds kind of weird to say because a lot of it is you know just killing people and killing zombies like ve- like very brutally and then that can be very it, it's a very jarring game but but it is fun to play because the gameplay is designed really well um it, i think it's t- it's pretty typical like action adventure type of game um you you played like some of the arkham games right yeah i played arkham asylum and arkham city okay it, it's kind of like that but toned down way what you know a lot because it's not you know you're not batman you're not jumping and flipping around and and have and have you know body armor on so i think the stealth is very similar um and there's uh and like it's not really about like melee like if you're in a situation like you can punch your way out of a situation if you have to but if it's like oh there are five guys in a room you're not going to be able to just take them out by just like running at them full at full force like you're gonna have to like find a way to sneak around them um there's a crafting system that allows you to like and like exploration and kind of collecting resources is is really important because you can craft med kits that can heal you or you can you know like molotov cocktails or like trip bombs and stuff like that um so yeah it's 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 definitely a strategic game where you don't have if 
it feels like you have just enough resources to survive, but you're never like, I am comfortable with how many things I have and how many tools I have to survive. So yeah, it, it's definitely, it's definitely a very, it's a fun game to play, but it's also very tense and you feel like you could die at any second. So. Yeah. Um, so in, in terms of the second game, uh, so how, like, what are your expectations for the second game? Um, I am so excited for it. Um, you know, I, I, by the time this, this is out, I, I will be playing it and I'm sure I'll probably talk about it on the next episode, but yeah, it's, um, uh, like last week, the review embargo, um, was lifted and it's been like universally praised it has like a 96 meta score and like critics are loving it or saying it is as good or better than the first game. So I, I'm really excited for it. Um, and I, I've, I've heard the, the story is great and, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. Nice. Um, so yeah, uh, moving on to what I've been up to. Uh, I also have to talk about a video game, but just in general, I'm not big on video games. I, I don't, I don't play a lot. Um, but one, the one like video game franchise that I've consistently come back to is oddly enough, the Pokemon franchise. Um, and the, oh, the past week I managed to get my hands on a Nintendo switch. Uh, and through that I have been playing Pokemon sword, uh, which is the, the latest Pokemon game to come out. I think it came out in like November. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh yeah it, it's it's the first pokemon game to like be on a full con or the full, first main series pokemon game at least to be on a full console uh rather than like a handheld device like a 3ds or something like that um and it's been a really interesting experience uh just because you could tell so game freak is the company that develops uh the games and you could tell that they were definitely also adjusting to having more like yeah, more like power with the system um, because there's a lot more to do uh, generally than in uh, than like the they did what they could uh, on the 3ds and such, um, but with Sword on the Switch, there's definitely a lot more like depth to the game in terms of like the environments that there are and but yeah, I guess uh, one one new feature that they added to to capitalize on uh, the the um the power of the switch was the the fact that pokemon can now wander around in the overworld uh, rather than just like randomly appear in whatever tall grass there are there is um so like you'll be wandering around a route or something and just seeing pokemon wander around and so it makes it a lot easier to like find the pokemon you're looking for um and it just makes it feel like more of a kind of a lived in world um like they still include like randomized encounters like if you run around the grass enough um, but it's, it definitely adds a new dimension to the game that separates it from the rest of the franchise. Um, but I thought it worked really well. And uh, they actually just had uh, the first, so they're releasing DLC for, uh, for Pokemon Sword and Shield um, called the, there, it comes in like two waves. There's the Isle of Armor, which came out yesterday. Uh, and then there's the Crown Tundra, which comes out like November. It's basically uh, like one giant like wild area um, so the wild area is is this area um, in which it's just one big open area in which there's a ton of uh, there's a ton of like different environments and different things you can do and it's basically them playing with the idea of having a truly like open world game um, and so with the Isle of Armor they basically took that idea that they had already implemented um, and then just went even further with it um, so with the Isle of Armor there's there's a ton more to do there's several like side stories and there's like a main story involving like training at a dojo um but it's also like a very large area to explore um and you can also explore like the ocean around it and that kind of stuff and it just makes it feel like a very um it's just very well made um which makes it a very enjoyable experience and you can go online and like battle uh, other trainers that are in the same area and see them wandering around your overworld as well um so it's basically, I don't know, my general opinion on Pokemon Sword as a whole um, is that it transitions the franchise onto console very well, um, and I'm really excited to see where they go with it next. Um, it, it seems like the, the right, a step in the right direction for the franchise that I already thought was in a good place. And yeah, it was very exciting. Genuinely, I think it's probably one of my favorite Pokemon games just because it's it's very immersive and there's a ton to do. And even though not uh, not all of the Pokemon are available in the Pokedex, which is kind of a bummer, um, the amount of Pokemon that they do offer is is it's it's 
it's quite what's, what's the word I'm looking for? It's the, there's a lot still there is what I'm trying to say. Um, and so you you have enough to work with. Um, and yeah, I've I've been having a really good time with it. And yeah, nice. Have you um, or are you planning on playing any other Switch games or? or yeah, um, I'm planning on playing some. Uh, I've gotten Mario Kart just because it's yeah. an essential must. Yeah. Um, but I thought about getting uh, like Legend of Zelda, like Breath of the Wild, or something like that, uh, just because like I don't, don't have a lot of experience with Zelda, but I feel like it's a franchise I could be into. Um, so, and I've heard nothing but great things about that one. So I was thinking about trying that out. And then there's a few other random things that I might pick up. But. Nice. Yeah. So I guess moving on from there, we're just going to jump straight into our, our movie news for the week. Um, usually we end up talking mostly about comic book movie news just because we're a couple of nerds. We like talking about comic book movies, but there's not that much to talk about this week. So we'll, we'll just start off with um, the news that broke this past week involving the nba of all things um and that's we're not, we're not a sports podcast guy yeah. um so the nba i guess uh so I, I did some reading up on this story a little bit uh prior to the podcast they are finishing like their season um in orlando uh, specifically at i think it's disney world or disneyland one of the two whichever one is in orlando uh they're finishing there um and i guess that like evening or weekend or whatever that they're doing that uh disney's kind of just like throwing them like a big party type thing uh and with that they're going to be screening some movies specifically some movies that have not been released yet um the biggest of which that's been making headlines is black widow um so the the headlines that have been going around is that the nba is uh is going to be getting to see black widow like two months early um which I kind of have mixed feelings on like it I don't know Marvel seems like the type of company to usually like put their fans uh first and like try to save something like that but also like this movie like the movie's done it was supposed to come out well over a month ago and like it sucks that it hasn't but they kind of just like have it sitting in a vault right now and I guess if they're wanting to have like show the NBA players a good time that's something you could do but also it kind of feels like you're robbing that from the fans a little bit because they still have to wait till November. Um, it's not it's not a good look, um, just from a PR standpoint. Um, but yeah, what do you think about this, David? I think it's just, it's just bizarre. Like I, I think I get that you know they're they're having the NBA season at a Disney complex and that's that's a big thing for them. That's something that they can you know like kind of you know you know that's a good PR look, I guess. But it's just kind of, I don't just don't really see the need to show a movie that hasn't come out yet months before, like just to a specific group of people. And I think if you're looking, you know, if it was just kind of like a random Disney movie, if it was like Artemis Fowl, it's like who would, no one would care and it would be fine. But, but also like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sure the NBA players, not all of them are Marvel fans. So they probably don't really even care too about that so, so, so it's just I think with something that's so you know secretive and you know they protect leaks as much as they can with Marvel it's just bizarre that they would show it to this group of people who you know they could just talk about it on social media and, and I'm sure they'll get them to sign some things and make sure that they don't talk about it but I, I feel like that's how you get things leaked and you know someone will just accidentally record the whole thing on their phone. Like they'll just be like streaming, streaming it on Instagram live. And like, that's how I'll watch the movie for the first time. So, so yeah, I just think it's just kind of weird, but yeah. Yeah, I agree. Um, like what, my big thing is like, why did they choose like this movie? Like, I feel like Disney's got plenty of other like major movies that they could show and still be like cool to the NBA players. But like, I don't know, this one in particular feels weird just because, the MCU has such an intense fan base that's been wanting to see it. Um, so I feel like they're just, they're getting into some murky water that they could have easily avoided. Um, but yeah, I guess, I mean, and this is still like a little ways away, so they could still pull this uh, and just show them something else instead, seeing, after seeing the reaction that people have had. Yeah, um, yeah I guess, guess we'll find out. Yeah. Um, Moving on from there, we also got a little bit of DC news uh, concerning DC fandom. So 
Uh, as I'm sure um, you're aware, if you're watching this podcast, uh, Comic-Con uh, in San Diego this year has been canceled, um, which that's where usually you get all the biggest like comic book movie news announcements of the year. Um, and so all the companies that usually go and present there are trying to like figure out what they can do instead. Um, and DC has decided that they're going to be hosting an online event called DC Fandom. I believe it's in August, um, in which they're going to be showing off uh, basically all of all their upcoming uh, movies, everything on their slate, um, which includes uh, Wonder Woman 84, which I just got pushed to November, I think. Yeah. I think so. yeah. Um, but then they're also going to be showing off footage from the Batman, uh, Suicide Squad. Um, uh, the Rock confirmed this morning that Black Adam is going to be there. Um, they're going to talk about the Snyder Cut and the crew from Shazam is going to be there. So I bet we get some news involving Shazam too as well. And personally, I think this is really exciting. Um, it's fun that DC is still like doing something like this uh, to give fans like the information that they're looking for. Um, and I think it's going to be it's going to be interesting to see wh how it goes um, in terms of like presentation. I assume it'll be like a live stream of some sort. Um, and so. Yeah, I'm I'm excited for it. Uh, it'll be fun to watch live, and yeah, because usually the like Comic Con panels, um, you can get some of them live, but a lot of the big ones like DC and Marvel usually they don't stream those live, and you just kind of if you're not there, you have to hear about it um, through the million articles that get written immediately after. Um, but so it'll be fun to like actually see this unfold as it's happening. Um, but yeah, what do you think about this, David? Yeah, no, I, I think it's really cool, and you know, I think. Comic-Con is, you know, you know, a few of my favorite days of the summer, just even though, you know, I've never been there and probably never will go there. Um, but, you know, like it's, it's something that's always fun to just, you know, keep an eye on it on Twitter and just see all the trailers and news and all the cool stuff that comes out of it. So I'm glad that we're going to get some of that, at least with, with these kind of like independent ones. Yeah. Um, and speaking of like Comic-Con and just general conventions like that, um, the Star Wars convention that happens every couple of years, Star Wars Celebration, uh, which was scheduled for later this year, has also officially been canceled, um, which is kind of a bummer because uh, they, they didn't have it last year because they were getting ready for the Rise of Skywalker and then they were going to come back strong this year. Um, but it obviously makes sense why they canceled it. Um, and I guess I assume that they'll do something similar to what DC is doing. I bet Disney in general does something similar. Um, they'll do like an online D23 or something in which they'll show off Star Wars material and Marvel material mm -hmm. um, and whatever else they want to talk about. Um, so I would expect that. Um, but yeah, we just got the confirmation that celebration isn't happening, which like, yeah, it sucks. Um, but yeah, it is what it is. Yep. Cool. Um, so moving on to the rest of our movie news, um, we have a few pretty interesting things to talk about. Uh, first of all, uh, the Oscars announced this week that they have postponed uh, the, the date for the ceremony. Um, it was scheduled to be at the end of February, and now it's been pushed, I believe, to the end of April. Um, and this is, I think, to give more time uh, for 2020 movies to come out and just so they, <laughs> they have movies to, to talk about, I guess. Um, I think this is the right move. It's going to feel weird having the Oscars this late. Um, because the Oscars are basically going to be around the time that we're finishing second semester. Um, like, yeah, like the, the Oscars are going to be during like my last week in college. Um, Wild. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, so it'll, it'll be interesting. And I don't, I don't know if they've released like what their specific rules, uh, updated rules are going to be in terms of like when a movie can be released and still qualify for that. Um, but I guess we'll find out. Um, I, I expect more announcements regarding this moving forward. Um, do you have any thoughts on this, David? Yeah, um, you know, I, I, I'm always excited for the Oscars, so I'm sad it'll be pushed back. Um, I hope this does not decrease the chances that Sonic will get Oscars, because <laughs> I think even with pushing back the date, they're still not going to have the normal amount of movies that they have. Um, so I'm, I'm crossing my fingers that Sonic gets some love uh, you know, maybe we'll sneak in there for best picture, but I think at least best supporting actor for Jim Carrey, I think is a lock. So, oh yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah, moving on from there, uh, we got some information regarding, uh, the latest film to come from director James Gray. Um, so James Gray, uh, he directed The Lost City of Z a few years ago. And then last year, uh, he directed Ad Astra, 
which was one of my favorite movies of the year. Uh, David has some different opinions on that movie. Um, but his latest film is uh, going to be called Armageddon Time. And he was talking about it, uh, I believe, with Deadline. Um, and he was talking about how he wanted to do something different for next, his next movie. So I guess it's more of a, it's less sci-fi. It's it's not like any sort of like intense genre like that. It's more of a coming of age story uh, that's based on his experiences growing up, uh, specifically in his transition from public to private school. Um, and he says he wants it to uh, kind of examine like how privilege uh, can affect like childhood. Um, and I think that sounds like a really interesting premise. Um, and then we've got a bunch of casting for the movie as well. Um, a while back, they announced Kate Blanchett was going to be in the movie. Um, but then this week, got, we got the news that she's being joined by Robert De Niro, Oscar Isaac, Donald Sutherland, and Anne Hathaway. Um, so I think that the cast is shaping up really nicely. Um, and it's already making it a movie that I'm very excited to see, um, both in premise and in cast. And I like the director. Um, so yeah, what do, you, what do you think about this, David? Yeah, I mean, as you said, Ad Astra wasn't my favorite movie. I thought it was fine. I didn't dislike it. I thought it was pretty solid. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think the problems I had with that movie weren't in any of like the direction or like the story. I thought that was interesting mostly. Um, so yeah, so so I think this looks really interesting to me. And as as someone who uh, went to a private Catholic high school, I think you know, I I think that this could be a really interesting movie for me. And, and, uh, I've, I've kind of seen the, you know, the, how privilege can affect kids. And, and I think that could be a really interesting thing, thing to examine in a movie. So yeah, I'm, I'm sure, you know, they'll probably round out this cast with, you know, some, maybe a kid from Stranger Things or, <laughs> or some other famous child actor. To, to, from like it or something. Yeah. Yeah, probably. So. Mm. Yeah. yeah. I think, I think this story, even though like it's it's different from what he's done in the past, I think the the base of the story feels like something that would be up his alley. Because mm -hmm. part of what I thought worked best in Ad Astra was was the emotion to it, and was the the like uh, yeah the emotion of like Brad Pitt's main character and just like his general mental state. Um, I thought it was a really good character study of who he was, um, and I think that. Um, is in large part due to uh, James Gray's direction and just his handling of the character. So I'm excited to see what he can do with uh, this kind of story with, uh, the name of the movie is Armageddon Time. I don't know if I ever mentioned that, which seems like a weird name for this kind of movie, but whatever. Um, moving on maybe from there. Maybe they're trying to trick people into thinking that it's an Armageddon sequel. But maybe. <laughs> they bring back Ben Affleck. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. But yeah, moving on from there, uh, we got some other news uh, involving director Pablo Lorraine, uh, who directed Jackie a few years ago. And apparently his next film is going to be called Spencer, and it's a film about Princess Diana, um, specifically uh, her being played by Kristen Stewart, um, which I think is an interesting choice. If I'm being honest, I don't know much about this, like the overall story of Princess Diana, just because like I wasn't born yet at that point, and it's not really... A conversation that I have frequently um, so uh, it'll be interesting to see like how he um, goes about telling this story and I think Kristen Stewart in this role uh, will be interesting because I think Kristen Stewart is genuinely like a great actress when she's given like the right material um, and so I think it'll be interesting to see her I think this could easily be like her le leveling up um, a bit and getting into more of like Oscar Beatty type movies which I think she would work really well in. Um, and then, I, yeah, because the with Jackie, uh, Pablo Lorraine directed Natalie Portman to an Oscar nomination for that. Um, so maybe we'll see the same for Kristen Stewart here. Granted, uh, at that point, like Natalie Portman was already like an acclaimed actress. Um, but, and Kristen Stewart's definitely been in things that she's gotten praise for. Um, but she's not like quite on that level yet. So I'm curious to see what this movie can do for her. Um, but yeah, what do you think about this, David? Yeah, I've never been a huge fan of Kristen Stewart. Um, but, you know, then again, I haven't seen her in very much. Um, I think the movie I liked her the most in was like American Ultra, which I think, you know, she's she's really solid in. Um, but, and, you know, I think she isn't who would first come to mind when I would think of someone who would play Princess Diana. But I think kind of, you know, resemblance wise, I think it works. And, and hey, I think, you know, I, I'm I'm sure she can do a good job in it, so. It's going to be weird hearing Kristen Stewart talk with a British accent. Um, yeah. Is she, 
Is she British or is she? American? No, I think she's. I think she's American. Okay. Maybe. But if she if she is British, that would be a, a big surprise. Yeah. <laughs> um. Yeah, I guess moving on from there, uh, uh, we got the news that Ewan McGregor has been cast as Jiminy Cricket uh, in Guillermo del Toro's adaptation of Pinocchio, which uh, I forgot that Guillermo del Toro was making a Pinocchio, um, and it, I don't believe it's with Disney or anything. I think it's just kind of a Guillermo del Toro version of Pinocchio, um, and seeing Ewan McGregor's name attached to that, uh, personally, I find really exciting, just because I love Ewan McGregor as an actor, I love Guillermo del Toro as director, and this seems like the weird thing that would be up both of their alleys. Um, so I think that this, there's nothing to be sad about here. I think it's going to turn out really well. Um, or at least it, it looks like it has a lot of potential um, from the little bit of news we've gotten so far. Um, yeah, what do you think about this casting? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I think Ewan McGregor was, you know, Disney or not Disney, he, he, he was good at, uh, you know, as Lumiere, as doing, and you know, another... Uh, voice actor for a CGI uh, sidekick in a Disney-like movie, pretty much. Um, so you know, I, I'm sure he'll do a great job, and and I, I think he he can provide some of that some of that sarcastic wisdom that uh, Jiminy Cricket has. So yeah, it, it's definitely not the role I would have initially thought of you and McGregor for, um, but I think it'll it'll be fun to say the least. Um, and yeah, then our last bit of news I want to talk about uh, is. It's just kind of a brief thing. Uh, so we got the news that Pete Davidson and Colin Jost, uh, both of which are from SNL fame, uh, are co-starring in a comedy for Universal called Worst Man. Um, the The premise of the of the movie is it's I you can we can assume that Colin Jost is going to be the one getting married just because he seems like yeah to fit that bill. Um, but yeah, the the premise is it's like the two weeks leading up to the main character's wedding and his best friend is just kind of. Yeah, not the great, uh, the great best man, but he wants him to be the best man anyway. And we can assume that'll be Pete Davidson just because it makes sense that way. Um, yeah. But yeah, I like this pairing. Uh, I'm a fan of both of them. Um, Colin Jost mo more so than Pete Davidson, but Pete Davidson's got some, uh, he's got a lot of uh, word talk. He's got a lot of people talking about him right now, specifically with King of Staten Island coming out. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how they both uh, do like in their own comedy because they both have in the past have kind of seemed in the movies they've been in have kind of seemed like side characters no, neither of them have been particularly like starring roles except for like a couple occasions um so it'll be interesting to see them star together um and note that there is not a director attached to this project yet um universal is still looking for a director um but it'll be interesting to see who they get on maybe we'll see um uh who uh, why am I blanking on the guy that directed The King of Staten Island? Uh, Judd Apatow. Judd Apatow. Maybe we'll see him tackle mm -hmm. something like this because it seems up his alley. Um, and he's worked with Davidson before, obviously. Um, but yeah, I think this sounds interesting. Um, do you have any thoughts on this, David? Yeah. Um, did you see The King of Staten Island? I have not gotten the chance to see it yet, no. Nice. I, I watched it uh, a few days ago. Um, and yeah, I, I think it's it's solid. It's kind of a typical Judd Apatow movie that, you know, has, you know, has kind of a rom-com element to it a little bit, um, but also kind of has these like underlying themes of loss and, and kind of how, and grief and how, you know, losing a parent at a young age can really affect someone. And I think that stuff is really interesting. I think it's not exactly paid off throughout the whole movie. Um, and I think it's kind of weirdly paced and, way too long because it's like two hours and 15 minutes which is I just think is too long for this kind of movie um but yeah it's solid uh I think just just in general like right now it's like 20 dollars on you know on streaming um on demand and I don't really know if it's worth that unless you're watching it with a large group of people but it's yeah it's pretty solid so nice yeah I'll probably check it out once it's a little cheaper than 20 dollars I don't I don't feel like dropping 20 bucks <laughs> on that movie right now but for sure it is what it is. Um, yeah, I guess from there we'll jump in. Uh, we'll jump into our main topic. Uh, and when it comes to our main topic, David and I were discussing what we wanted to talk about this week. Uh, and then uh, we remembered a podcast we did a while back, in which we both, uh, prior to that week, had gone and seen uh, Star Trek II: The Wrath of Khan. And so we just made that our main topic for the week. So we wanted to do something else like that, and just pick an old movie that we both have seen uh, and just talk about it. 
so the movie we decided to do this week uh, is Inception, which Inception's a movie that um, was kind of instrumental in my developing a love for movies, but David actually saw it recently for the first time. Um, so I think we've both got some, some opinions to, to share. So David, I'll let you start. Uh, what, what's kind of your initial reaction to Inception and just generally your thoughts? Yeah, for sure. So I watched it for the first time about a month ago. And I think, you know, this was, this also was kind of, it came out around the time when I was starting to get interested in kind of more mainstream movies and more, I guess, grown up movies, I guess. Um, and so I, it was definitely something I was aware of. And that was kind of like the first Oscar season that I started to kind of get aware of. But, it, you know, I just, I, I just never saw it. Um, but yeah, I really enjoyed it the first time I, I watched it. Um, I watched it kind of like in a Netflix party. Um, so I was watching it with other people and I wasn't fully kind of paying attention from the beginning because we were just kind of talking and, and, and just, you know, not, we weren't fully keyed in, not keyed in on it. Um, but I really enjoyed it, even though I found myself very confused for much of it, um, just because I, you know, I don't think, you know, it's a fairly, it's not a, it's not a linear movie because it's a Christopher Nolan movie. Um, so I just kind of found, I was just a little lost at times, but even when I was confused, I still enjoyed it and I liked where it was going. Uh, but then I rewatched it um, yesterday and I loved it. And I, I was fully on board with what was happening and where the story was going and how the characters were developing. And I think it's great. And I think it's definitely one of my favorite Christopher Nolan movies, so. Yeah, um, Inception was honestly probably like the movie that first, I wanna say like first introduced me to Christopher Nolan. Like I, I had seen um, his like Dark Knight trilogy prior to that, but that was like all I had seen from him. Um, and so Inception was the first movie that I watched that was truly like a Christopher Nolan, like his story, like his kind of movie. Um, and so the first time I watched it, I don't know, I was probably like sophomore in high school. Um, and it just, at the time I found it to be like the most like mind blowing, like big thing ever. And it was just like all I would talk about. Um, and since then I've seen it probably at least like half a dozen times in, on, in various, uh, in various settings. Um, but one thing I think really makes the film work so like obviously it's a very uh grand and complicated movie with dreams and dreams inside of dreams and just a bunch of like weird high concept stuff um but at its core i think uh what makes it work is the relationship between uh Cobb and mal or mal or mal oh. um uh, leonardo dicaprio and uh why can i not remember her name uh, uh, Marianne Cotillard, yeah. Uh, the relationship between their characters, um, which I won't delve too deeply into because even though the movie came out 10 years ago, there's still, I don't want to spoil it just because it's the kind of movie that you don't really want to have spoiled. Um, but yeah, I think how they handle that storyline between the two of them really kind of ties um, the emotional, uh, the emotion into the movie um, and kind of gives it a bit of a, a bit of an emotional core. Um, and I think both of their performances are fantastic. Um, it was uh, one of the first like performances from Leonardo DiCaprio that I had seen at the time. Um, and so it really kind of introduced me to him as an actor. Um, same with Marianne Cotillard. And just the cast as a whole is fantastic with Tom Hardy and Joseph Gordon-Levitt um, and Ken, Wat Ken Watanabe, I believe is his name. Um, and just in general, I think everyone in the cast does a great job. And I think Nolan give, does a good job of giving everyone uh, something to work with. Um, and all of the characters are distinctly different from one another. So all the actors have their own moments to shine. Um, and yeah, uh, I, think it's, I think it's a great film. Uh, I, I think when we, when we talked about our favorite movies of the decade, this is one that I brought up. Uh, I don't remember where it was at on that list. I think uh, if I had to guess, it was probably like in the top five uh, off the top of my head. That's where I would put it now, but also I don't remember what the list was. Um, but yeah, I love Inception. It's a movie that's aged very well. And it's the kind of movie that every time you watch it, you pick up on something new um, and has one of probably the best endings to, to any like big budget movie I've seen in a long time. And it's, yeah, it's an iconic ending and yeah. I love it. It's fantastic. Um, 
do you want to do you want to talk a little bit about that ending and what you think what is your interpretation of that ending sure um so yeah i i said earlier that we were gonna that i was trying to avoid spoilers but i guess if if you haven't seen it this is your warning uh we're gonna talk about the ending um so i go back and forth on the ending um my i think that where i've eventually landed on it is that uh he is kind of like in the real world there at the end um and the the spinning top was just kind of a tease to the audience i think that what that was genuinely um him coming back to his family um because i realized that's the more like wholesome traditional movie ending um but something that uh, a lot of people have pointed out was that they don't think uh that the top is actually uh his totem they think it's malls um and because you can see throughout the uh, film that in some shots he's wearing a wedding ring in other ones he's not um and so people think that that might be his totem um and in that last sequence i don't remember if he's wearing it or if he's not and which one is which but i remember it, it kind of clues in that he is in the real real world um if you look at it from that perspective um so that's kind of what i subscribe to um but what do you think yeah i i'm in the same line of thinking and with that wedding ring i believe it's when he has it on he always has it on when he's dreaming um but when and that kind of fits with his you know deepness of conscious he still wants to be with her and still tries to kind of keep her trapped in his subconscious mm -hmm. um but at the end he does not have his wedding ring on so so that's kind of a major clue that he is not dreaming and, and i think even though that is yeah the more cliche ending i guess and, and kind of the more traditional ending i think it it does i, th I think it completes the movie um in a, in a better way if he is not dreaming because that's the arc of that character is he needs to come back to reality and th this technology that, that allows him to, you know, access his subconscious, access his subconscious has kind of ruined his life and has detached him from reality. So I think, and the whole movie is about reality and what is real and what is not and letting go of what you want reality to be and accepting what reality actually is. And I think that completes that arc better if he is yeah. not true. I, I agree. Um, one other thing that I wanted to bring up uh, is uh, just the general pacing of the movie. It's a very like fast paced movie um, and there's a lot going on, but yet it's still decently like easy to follow. Like, yeah, you can, especially upon first viewing, you can very easily get lost, but there's still like main like story points that you can follow and a lot of the details you might lose, but you'll catch up on, you'll catch them again on future viewings. Um, but yeah, I think the the pacing uh, does a good job of like really grabbing you and like sucking you into the movie. Um, and I like how the further, like the further they go into the dream um, and like the more change of setting they have, um, the, the like more invested you become in what they're doing. Um, and I like how, so eventually like, they, they go like, I think three, three dreams deep um, and each one, has a, like a distinctly different tone to it. So like there's the, there's the city where it's downpouring all the time and then they're in the hotel and then they're like on the snowy mountainside. And I think each of those dreams are so distinctly different from one another that it works really well and it's easy to follow what's going on in each one. Um, and one thing that I think works really well between those dreams is the, the like time dilation and how differently time is moving uh, for each one. And I think Nolan does a really good job at making that like understandable to the audience um, and making that something that's easy to grasp. And so you understand like, as these characters are doing one thing, they'll do that much faster than another character who's a few dreams uh, either up or down. Um, but yeah, I think it's, uh, it's a very complicated movie, but Nolan does a good job of making it easy to, easy to follow and easy to stomach. Um, and yeah, I think that's just a testament to his both writing and directing abilities. Um, personally, I think he's probably one of the best filmmakers we have right now, which I know is quite the hot take. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, I love Inception. Uh, the score uh, by Hans Zimmer, I think, is probably one of the, the best film scores of the past decade. Um, it's one of those scores that you can continuously, like, look into and analyze. And one, like, little detail that I think is kind of fun is 
So you know the like French song that comes up throughout the movie that they like use to wake each other up. Uh, the main like theme of the movie, uh, like with the the big like boings, is really just like a very slowed down version of that song um, that Hans Zimmer like kind of tweaked a bit and then fit in, uh, which I think is just a really nice detail. Um, and yeah, it's it's a great score, it's a great movie, great cast, just everything about it. I love Inception. If you haven't seen it, you should watch it. But yeah. yeah. Uh, anything um, else you want to add on to that, David? Yeah, maybe just to wrap up, how does it compare to other Christopher Nolan movies? If you want to do a quick, not not full ranking, but kind of where it kind of lies. I think it's definitely like if you were if you were to rank all of Christopher Nolan's movies, which maybe we can do on a future podcast. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think it would definitely be towards the top of that list. Um, personally, I don't think it's my favorite Christopher Nolan movie. I think my favorite might be uh might be um why i'm blanking on the name of it the prestige um i've just been blanking on a lot of things today but whatever um yeah the prestige i think is just such a unique movie um that that would probably be my favorite christopher nolan movie but inception is also up there and might even be my favorite depending on the day um it's definitely a very good introduction to his his style and just who he is as a director. And so I think if you haven't watched any Christopher Nolan movies, uh, Inception is the place to start. Um, it's a good like jumping on point. Um, but yeah, what do you think? Yeah, I, I agree. You know, I think I, th- I think that's a very good idea for a uh, future episode. Um, but yeah, I, I still need to see a few. But just of, of the ones I've seen, he's very good at um, bending time in both the mo- in both the narrative sense and like how he presents it to the audience and kind of he's really good at misdirecting you on what is happening and where and when and I think both Inception and The Prestige do that in really different but 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 pretty fairly similar ways um so I think it's and I, I need to rewatch The Prestige because it's been a while but I, I think those two are probably my favorite um and and, and you know I think the Dark Knight is very, and kind of the whole Dark Knight trilogy is very different from his other movies. Um, yeah. So, and and I think, you know, I think the Dark Knight is probably my favorite of all of his movies, most likely. Um, but but yeah, I think I think those three are kind of my my top three. Yeah. So I'll agree with that. Yeah, Dark Knight, Prestige, and Inception. Yeah. Um, have you ever heard of uh, Insomnia? um um yes yeah that's it's another one of his films i believe it was his second major film so he did memento and i think he did insomnia after memento um and insomnia is an interesting film in his discography because it's a great movie and there's great performances in it but it's probably the most like general drama that christopher nolan's ever made like there's no like kind of weird nolanisms in it at all it's just kind of like a murder mystery um that takes place in like Alaska I think um and it, it's really good but it's it's definitely and it's an interesting point in his filmography because it's the most like not bland but like and not I'm trying to say it like bland and generic but not quite as intense as those words uh films for him it's the most like normal film for him um, um so yeah that's that's an interesting one but it's still like worth a watch um but yeah I guess on that note, uh, we're going to start wrapping it up. So this has been Cinebraskans, the Daily Nebraskan Entertainment Podcast. Uh, As always, I'm your host, Kyle Cruz, joined by my co-host, David Berman. And yeah, thanks for tuning in. See ya. See ya.